What's up? I got a short message for you. Uh, before I get started uh, and talk about this, the power behind the music, this is a, this is a track that I wrote. First of all, I'm not uh, some fundamentalist Christian. I grew up in some fundamentalist, churchy type household where I wasn't exposed to this stuff and I'm coming from an outside perspective. No, I don't think so. That's not from my perspective. I used to be a death metal singer. I was into hardcore, grindcore, gore, grind, everything like that. I grew up on rock music. That whole scene, that was my life. That's how I grew up. So this isn't from an outside perspective of some fuddy-duddy that's uh, talking about something that I don't understand. I know I understand it perfectly well. Not only did I listen to it, I played it myself. Okay? So don't try to, to write me off and saying that because right off the bat, you're wrong. Okay? So having said that, let's get into this message that I got. And, you know, I'm not just going to read this the whole time. I'm going to offer some comments. But first, we got a Bible verse here right at the top. It says, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Ecclesiastes 7 5. It is. You know, because you might seem like a rebuke to you, like, ah, oh, he's saying some things about music or whatever. But it's better for you to hear that than the song of fools. And, and that's what it is, man. You're going to see that at the end. All right? So check this out. It's better for someone to tell you the truth, even if it's ugly and harsh, than for someone to make you feel good with lies and entertainment. You want me to lie to you? Make you feel good? Is that what you want me to do? You'd rather me just lie to you? Oh, that's what they do on TV? You want that? Go watch Joel Osteen. He'll lie to you so he can, he can uh, fleece the flock and get millions of dollars out of your pocket. I don't ask you for anything. This is free. And I'm going to tell you the truth. And you might get upset. I don't want you to get upset, but hey, I'd rather you know the truth. It seems as if all anyone wants to hear today is the song of fools. To lull them into a sense a false sense of happiness. Music is used by many as an escape from the insane world that we live in. It is, and I used to do it myself. I used to use music as an escape. Music is like a drug that makes you feel good, numbs the pain, leaves you craving for more. It is absolutely a drug. Music is a drug. When you listen to it, you got dopamine releasing in your brain. All different types of music. Many different types of music. Music is used, but you know, a lot of the, the music we're going to be talking about today is more like rock and metal type music. Music is used for an outlet for emotion like depression, anger, and frustration. People turn to music for that, like I said, like I did. While at the same time intensifying and fueling these same emotions. Exactly. You know, you turn to this when you're angry, you're depressed, whatever it is, to get it out. But it ends up actually making it worse and intensifying it. Oh, I'm depressed. So what am I going to do? You go listen to some sad song. And you feed into it more. Music is a very powerful force that can shape attitudes and opinions of entire generations. It influences worldviews, speech, attitudes, and appearance. 100% it does. You can even see that in, you know, this was more true back in the day. There used to be different things. Uh, looks for people in different scenes. You were in the punk scene, you looked a different way. In, in hardcore, you were in metal, you looked a different way. You liked the acid rock, whatever, those types of things. Hippies, they all had different looks and it was a reflection of the music that they listened to. It influenced their, even their appearance. To some, music is a way of life and they could not live without it. To say that music does not affect people is the height of willful ignorance. Come on, go bring that to somebody else because that's a bunch of garbage telling me that music doesn't impact people and influence their life. It absolutely does, 100%. Some questions you want to ask yourself are, could music be used to manipulate you? You don't want to ask that question, do you? Because no one wants to think that you've been manipulated. No one wants to think that you've been deceived. But let's be honest with yourself. Could music be used by unseen intelligent forces to influence your behavior to conform to their will? Oh, that's another crazy question. You might say, oh man, I don't believe in any of that stuff. Unseen intelligent forces, what are you talking about? Well, I'm going to show you. Because I'm not just going to give you Bible verses. I'm going to give you that. But I'm going to give you evidence. I'm going to prove it to you. I'll give you sources that you can even go look up yourself later. In the end, does the music you listen to 
help you or harm you. You may have heard or read a Christian talk about rock music before as the devil's music, and they called it satanic, right? Remember that? Oh, all the crazy, you know what's funny? Oh, all the crazy fundamentalists and crazy Christians who talked about this back in the day, back in the 80s and in the 90s and all this stuff, and they were warning about all that stuff. They were just crazy, burning records back in the 50s and stuff. Oh, man, they were crazy. And oh, yeah, remember all the ones that were warning about the slippery slope? Yeah, now what? Now what? What do you got to say about how society is right now and talk about the slippery slope fallacy? Nothing to say, do you? Okay? Oh, you might have heard them say, oh, the devil's music, they call it satanic. And you're like, ah, this provokes, this usually prompts a response of laughter and mockery by those who listen to rock, metal, whatever, etc. Because they think such things are silly superstition made up by ignorant Christians. Oh, it's so silly, stupid Christians. Man, they don't know anything. They don't know what they're talking about. Oh, they're hysterical. They're making it up. The question we should ask, first of all, is what makes something satanic? Right? Because you might think, man, I don't worship the devil. I don't even believe in the devil. Okay, great. But I gotta, you got to define what that means first. Because people hear the word satanic and they automatically dismiss it. But you got to define it first. The fact is, many rock and metal artists make reference to Satan in their lyrics. That is a fact. And you might say, oh, it's just tongue-in-cheek. It's just for shock value. I'm going to prove to you it's not. Okay? They make reference to Satan in their lyrics. They talk about the devil as if he is not uh, such a bad guy. Like the song N.I.B. by Black Sabbath. Go look at the lyrics to that song. N.I.B. Nativity in Black. And I know the whole story. He had the occult book. He saw the shadow sitting on the end of his bed. All that stuff. But look at the lyrics. Just read it. Devil's not such a bad guy. And that hell is really a party. Highway to Hell by ACDC. Everybody jokes around about that. Oh yeah man. I'm on a highway to hell. And they laugh. All my friends will be there. Making fun of hell. The rock bands are the ones that are trying to lie to you and tell you that it's a party. Most people respond to this by saying that all the references to Satan are purely tongue-in-cheek. Or simply for the sake of rebellion against the status quo of society and religion. Oh, it's just to make the Christians mad. It's to make Tipper Gore mad. Right? Just to make people break taboos. That's the only reason they do it. Maybe that's what you think. That's not what the bands think. The problem is that... Uh, the problem with that is that you don't take into consideration the beliefs of the bands themselves and what they admit to believe. You just put your own interpretation on what they do. You gotta look at what they say. If you would study the lyrics, album covers, and interviews with many bands, you would see a huge influence by a man, by a man, by the name of Aleister Crowley. Now, you may or may not have heard about this man. Maybe you have, and maybe you think, oh, I'm just going to make up a bunch of stuff, Christian fundamentalist propaganda about him. No, no, no. I'm going to quote him. In context, without spin. Okay? Now, Aleister Crowley is the biggest influence on rock and roll. So, I'm going to prove that to you. But first, I'm going to show you uh, who this guy was, what he believed. Okay? So, we're going to talk, we're going to take a couple quotes from Aleister Crowley about what he believed, what he was like. Then, we're going to show you the influence he had on rock music and bands. Many, many bands. All right? So, check this out. Aleister Crowley is probably the most infamous Satanist in history. He committed heinous acts of child rape and sacrifice, practiced black magic by summoning up demons, devils, and was called the wickedest man that ever lived. Absolutely. He did all those things. In fact, he was so messed up that Mussolini kicked him out of the country in Sicily, okay? You may say to yourself, come on, man, child sacrifice, you're insane, that's crazy, no way. 
Okay, let's read what he said. Read Crowley's words for yourself. Quote, For the highest spiritual working, one must according choose that victim which contains the greatest and purest force. A male child of perfect innocence and high intelligence is the most satisfactory and suitable victim. But the bloody sacrifice, though more dangerous, is more efficacious, and for nearly all purposes, human sacrifice is the best. And the quote is from Alistair Crowley, Magic Lieber, ABA, Book 4, Parts 1 through 4, Part 3, Magic and Theory and Practice, 1994, Ordo Templi Orientis Edition, page 207 and 208. Sorry for the extensive listing of the source, but I want to make sure you know I'm not just making this up. And so he said, yeah, you want power for the highest spiritual working? You need to do uh, human sacrifice. And he says the greatest is a male child of perfect innocence. Child sacrifice. That's what he advocated for and what he did. And by the way, also, another thing, just to add my personal testimony, I have personally talked to someone who used to be in the OTO, Ordo Templi Orientis, and they happened to be, their girlfriend was a, what they call a scarlet woman in that cult. And he said he found out that this is the type of stuff they were into, and he had to get out. So I know that not only did Alistair Crowley talk about this, but it still happens today. Oh, you might not see it in the news, but it does. Now you may ask yourself, you must ask yourself, why would all these bands be so greatly influenced by such an evil man? You should also ask yourself, if none of these bands believe that Satan is real, why are they influenced by a man who did? Okay, that's, and here's the thing, okay? You can't get around this, all right? You say, you don't believe in Satan. Okay. But you try to tell me all oh, the bands didn't believe in Satan. Okay. Why did they all look up to and love this guy, Alistair Crowley, who did? He was not an atheistic Satanist. He was theistic Satanist. He believed in the devil and he said it. Okay. Look at, look at these quotes. Quote. I simply went over to Satan's side and to this hour I cannot tell why. Alistair Crowley, Confessions of Alistair Crowley, page 65. He said, I went to Satan's side. Here's another one. I was not content to believe in a personal devil and serve him, in the ordinary sense of the word. I wanted to get hold of him personally and become his chief of staff. Alistair Crowley, Confessions of Alistair Crowley, page 66. And another from a, another book that Crowley wrote called The World's Tragedy, that religion they call Christianity, the devil they honor they call God. I accept these definitions as a poet must do if he be uh, he is to be at all intelligible to his age, and it is their God and their religion that I hate and will destroy. Alistair Crowley, The World's Tragedy, part uh, page thirty-five. Okay. So he said he believed the devil, he served the devil, became his chief of staff, and he hates Christianity. He hates it, wants to destroy it. And these bands are influenced by love this guy. And you want, want and I'm going to show you right now how much they were obsessed with Aleister Crowley. Okay? So here we go. Here's just a sampling. Just a few examples. Aleister Crowley is on the cover of the Beatles album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts, as one of their heroes. Got all these faces of people that influenced them in the front, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts. Right on that album cover, I think it's like I'm in the top left on the back row, Aleister Crowley's face they put on there. The Beatles. Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin moved into Crowley's old house at Loch Ness. It's called Bolskine. Moved into that house, he bought that, and Led Zeppelin also inscribed Crowley's motto, Do What Thou Wilt, on the vinyl of the album Led Zeppelin 3. They inscribed it. Jimmy Page absolutely was a disciple of Aleister Crowley. Uh, next one, Ozzy Osbourne. 
Ozzy said Crowley was a phenomenon of his time. That's what Ozzy said about Crowley. And dedicated a song to him. What song? Mr. Crowley. Who do you think that's about? Mr. Crowley. That's about Aleister Crowley, the Satanist. Which contains the following lyrics. You fooled all the people with magic. You waited on Satan's call. Mr. Crowley, won't you ride my white horse? Ozzy liked Aleister Crowley. Looked up to him. Said he was a phenomenon of his time. That's right. The Doors. How about them? The Doors put a bust of Crowley on the back of their album. 13. Go look at that. Go look at the album 13. Turn it. Look below. They're all sitting down. And there's Aleister Crowley's face. They're all sitting around it. They put that there. Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden. Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden wrote the song Man of Sorrows about Crowley. And that's pretty blasphemous, by the way, because the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53 that Jesus Christ is a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He's called, he said he wrote the song Man of Sorrows about Aleister Crowley. And uh, Bruce Dickinson wrote the screenplay for the movie Chemical Wedding about Crowley. Okay, so made this movie about him. Why are they making movies about Aleister Crowley? Because they look up to him. They're influenced by him. David Bowie, another big Crowleyite. David Bowie also looked up to Crowley. In Bowie's 1971 song, Quicksand, go look up the lyrics to this, he sang, I'm closer to the golden dawn, immersed in Crowley's uniform, uniform of imagery. Now, uh, immersed in Crowley's uniform of imagery, so that's Alice Crowley, but he says I'm closer to the Golden Dawn. Golden Dawn is one of the secret societies that Aleister Crowley was initiated into. He was part of Ordo Templi Orientis and the Order of the Golden Dawn. Why is David Bowie talking about the Golden Dawn and Aleister Crowley? Because he was a disciple. Followed his teachings, influenced by it. So think about it. We got, what do we have? The Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Ozzy Osbourne, The Doors, Iron Maiden, David Bowie, we could go on and on. You've seen, uh, there's a picture of Jay-Z with the hoodie. It says, do what thou wilt on that. That's the Aleister Crowley saying. Why? They all, oh, they don't believe in the devil. You don't believe in the devil. They don't, oh, you say they don't believe in it. Why do they all like him? Why are they all influenced by this guy who's a Satanist? And who says you should do uh, child human sacrifice. Because they know about power. That's why. How do you think they got famous? Well, you know, they're really good at what they do. Well, yeah, they are. Of course they are. But how did they get good? Well, they just practice really well. Guess what? Okay? Let's dispel that myth right now. Okay? You ever ask yourself that question? I know you have. Man. There's some really talented musicians who are way more talented than some people that are famous and get record contracts. In fact, man, how do even some of these people get famous and get record contracts? They're not that talented because that's not what it's about. It's not the most, whoever's the most talented is becomes famous. Absolutely wrong. You got to have doors open for you. How do the doors open? You got to have that power. Where's the power come from? Not from this world. You got to have power from that other world that we can't see. How do you get it? Well, these bands knew how. They knew Crowley was tapped into it. Why do you think they all were into him? Because they know he knew how to get the power. We're going to get it too. And if you're smart, you're savvy, you can go find other bands talking about this stuff. In fact, there may or may not be a video out there about a guy from the band The Scorpions talking about a party he went to and there was some pretty bad stuff going on there. Go find that interview. See what happens. There's also a clip of Bob Dylan talking about he made a deal a long time ago. And he says, who, who are you talking about? Are you talking about God? He says, no, the other guy. 
He said, what do you guys, do you think they're all joking? They're all just making it up. They're all talking about Satan and, and they all just made it up. Keep telling yourself that. You're lying to yourself because you don't want to face the truth that this stuff is real and that's how they get their power and that's how they became famous and that's how they became successful and their bands did what they did and their bands had such a big impact is because they had a little bit of help from another dimension. That's the power behind the music. More examples could be given of Crowley's influence on rock and metal, but this should be sufficient to prove the point. What is the point? The point is that these bands look to the Satanist Aleister Crowley's teachings for power. Power that is obtained by connecting with spirits from another realm in order to obtain fame, fortune, and other worldly musical talent. Absolutely. Remember all those legends? Oh, uh, Robert Johnson went down to the crossroads. You ever look back at the, some of the stories? He he couldn't play that good. Then he left. He came back. All of a sudden, he was really good. And then who did he influence? Almond Brothers, all those other type of people. That's right. Cream sang, sang about it. And went down to the crossroads. Oh, it's just, you know, just myths and legends. That's all it is. Yeah, they just all sing about the same thing for no reason. Power that is obtained, connecting with spirits from another realm in order to obtain all that stuff. In exchange for this power, what do the bands do? Oh, I'll tell you what they do. They promote Crowley's central teaching to the masses, their masses of fans, which is, do what thou wilt. Okay? Because you might say, here's the thing, okay? You might say, well, you know, okay, great. They were all in that stuff, but I'm not into that stuff, and... You know, I'm not a Satanist, so I don't believe in the devil, so it's all just a bunch of garbage. Okay. So you think that you're not impacted by this. And you think that you're not Satanic, you don't believe in anything Satanic, you don't practice anything Satanic, you're not involved in any of that stuff. Right? That's what you think? What's Aleister Crowley's teaching? Do what thou wilt. The Satanist said, do what thou wilt. Do what thou wilt is truly a satanic doctrine. Do you know what it means? Do whatever you want. In other words, rebellion. Do whatever you want. No rules. The main thing that makes rock and metal satanic is the promotion of rebellion. You don't have, in order to do for something to be satanic, to be satanic, it doesn't mean you got to get, go sacrifice a goat. Or kill someone, draw a pentagram in your room and summon spirits and light black candles. You don't have to do any of that. All you got to do is be live in rebellion. That's it. You got to be a rebel against God. That's satanic. That's what you don't get. What's the Bible say about rebellion? This is what God says about rebellion. 1 Samuel 15, 20 thief. 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Another one, Proverbs 17, 11, an evil man seeketh only rebellion. An evil man, oh yeah. You, you might think, oh yeah, I'm not an evil man. You know, I don't hurt anybody. I don't rob banks and, and kill people and rape and all these other bad, evil things. Evil man seeketh only rebellion. Rebellion against what? The commandments of God. Rebellion is witchcraft and evil, the Word of God says. Just read it to you. It also says rebellion is sin. What is sin? 1 John 3, 4, for sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the breaking of God's law. Okay? So rebellion is sin. Sin is breaking God's law. What do they got? The Judas Priest song? Breaking the law. Breaking the law. No, he's just talking about the, you know, the laws of the land. Oh, he's not talking about breaking God's law too? Okay. Rebellion is against God and his law. That's what rebellion is. You are rebelling against, living in rebellion against God. And some of you are stuck in this teenage rebellion for your entire life. And you're still acting like a teenage rebel in your 30s, 40s, and 50s. You're stuck there. Frozen in time in that teenage rebellion. 
Rebellion against God and his law. Did you know that breaking God's commandments is satanic? Well, it is, absolutely. See, I, I, like I said, I don't do anything satanic. I'm not into any of that stuff. What are you talking about? Well, the Bible says, 1 John 3, 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. He that committeth sin is of the devil. You live a life of sin and rebellion against God, you're of the devil. Your behavior shows you who your father is. You can claim, maybe you might even claim you believe in God. You might even claim that you're a Christian. But your behavior shows you who your father is. If your behavior is characterized, characterized by rebellion, it means that your father is the devil and not God. No, it's not. So you better stop deceiving yourself right now. Because if your life is a life of rebellion, your father is the devil, not God. John 8, 44, Jesus said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. You do the lust of the devil, the devil's your father. That's what Jesus said. What would be some examples of these lusts that people indulge in? Let's read from Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, uh, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, not going to heaven. Drunkards and what do they say about rock and roll? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. What does the Bible say? Fornicators and drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. The entire rock and roll lifestyle of fornication, drunkenness, rebellion is completely satanic. It's against God in every single way, and it is uh, you are not on your way to heaven if that's what you're partaking in. This rebellion against God must be punished by God or else he would be an unjust judge. If God let Hitler or Aleister Crowley in heaven and didn't punish them, he would be a corrupt judge. Imagine that. Serial killers, pedophiles. If, imagine if God just, whoop, yeah, they can come into heaven, no problem. I'll just, I'm, since I'm such a forgiving God, I'll just let them in. That would make God evil, unjust. He would be a corrupt judge. But since God is just, he will punish all sinners who have rebelled against him. Look at this, Jude 1.14. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Everything you've said against God, oh, he's going to judge you for it one day. Oh, oh, you might say, oh, God, if God's real, strike me down right now. Eh, he, he's not going to do that. The Bible says that God sends, he, he says the rain fall on the, the just and the unjust. He allows you to exist, to eat, to have things that you need to sustain you in life. Gives you mercy and second chances your entire life until you die, even when you're cursing him because he, he's long-suffering to you. The punishment for sinning against God is torment in the lake of fire for eternity. Revelation 21.8 But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's the punishment. I don't want you to go there. That's why I'm trying to warn you about this stuff. So you get off the path that you're on right now. Since God is also love and desires to make peace with the rebels, he satisfied the demands of the law that we cannot keep, okay? Now, even though right now, the Bible says, you're an enemy, if you're living in rebellion, you're an enemy of God. You're a rebel against God. He desires to make peace with you. He does want you to experience his love. And so because of that, he satisfied the demands of the law that we cannot keep. Everyone has sinned, Romans 
for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no such thing as a good person when compared to God's standard. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.10. Okay? Everyone sinned, no such thing as a good person. Because man is a sinner and cannot perfectly keep God's law, someone had to die in our place as a substitute or we would all go to hell. The justice had to be satisfied. That person is Jesus Christ. He perfectly kept all of God's commandments and then was punished on the cross to satisfy the demands of God's justice. Jesus took the punishment you deserve as a rebel against God. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Died for you even when you're a sinner and a rebel against God. Christ died for your sins so that you could be forgiven and make peace with God. The way to make peace with God is simple. Repent and put your faith in Jesus Christ. Acts 20.21 20, says, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, everyone. Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith. What does repent mean? Repent means to turn your back on your life of rebellion against God. You need to say in your heart, you don't want that anymore. You don't want to live a life of rebellion against God anymore. You're sorry for it, you hate it, and you want to turn your back on that life of rebellion. Be sorry for your sin and hate your sin. Ezekiel 8.30 says, Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Okay? So you turn from that rebellion and you turn to Jesus Christ. Putting your faith in Christ means believing that he died for your sins, that he was buried and rose again the third day. It means to trust him with all your heart as your only hope of salvation. Romans 10, chapter 10 verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For at the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ died for your sins, he took the punishment that you deserve, he rose from the dead, you confess, you believe that in your heart, and you confess that with your mouth, you cry out to God to save you, to forgive you of your sin. He'll give you the gift of eternal life. You'll be saved. You'll be born again. If God is convicting you of your sin and rebellion against him, cry out to him for forgiveness and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation from sin and hell. Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of of sins. Cry out to him. Ask him to save you. You can be forgiven of your rebellion. If you repent of that rebellion, you say you don't want to do that anymore. Live in rebellion against God. You repent of that, put your faith in Jesus Christ, you'll be saved, you'll make peace with God, you'll be given the gift of eternal life, you'll be born again. Being born again means you're supernaturally transformed. God gives takes that heart of stone you got right now and he gives you a new heart heart of flesh and with your new heart you'll have new desires you'll be changed the Bible says if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new your old you will pass away all that filthiness of that life all that sex, drugs and rock and roll that all be put away instead you'll be a new person a new creature in Christ and you'll have new desires. You want to, instead of living that life, you want to read the Bible. You want to pray. You want to talk to other Christians. You want to tell people about the gospel. And you will be totally changed. That's true biblical salvation. And that's what you need if you're living in rebellion against God. Again, So, again, to summarize this, it's not that the music is sending you to hell it's the influence and the message and the impact that it has on you which is the promotion of rebellion and rebellion against God sends you to hell condemns you absolutely 100% and, in, and, and the rebellion is inextricably tied together with that because of the influence that, that you know 
this satanic stuff has been integrated into it from the very beginning. It's just a fact. And so anyways, you see the point now. You see the truth of the situation that you're in right now, and you see the way out. I can't force you to make this decision. It's all up to you. And maybe you need some time to think about that. That's fine. But please urgently consider what I said, especially consider what the Bible says. That's the most important thing. Not my opinion, but what God says in the Word of God. Think about it. And if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email, treadingserpents at hotmail.com. I'll link the contact in the description. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.